Hi, this is Pierre Sabac, and today I'm going to be speaking to my good friend Neil Haig. Uh, we're going to be talking about his new and latest book, Orion's Dar. Now, just before I want, we start, I, I want to mention just how great this book is. In fact, I rate this as this is probably the best book that I've read on symbolism in the last decade. This is how good the book is. It's up there with all the great um, writers on symbolism, such as Manlia Hall, Blavatsky, Harold Bailey, The Language of Symbolism. I'm trying to think also, I made a list. Let's have a look. Um, Star Names um, by Richard Inkley Allen. So again, there's an emphasis on um, Orion's Star with astrotheological symbolism. So anybody who's interested in astrotheological symbolism or the language of symbolism, then I definitely recommend this book. But I want to begin, first of all, just by a general overview of the book. Now, this is uh, probably going to be quite difficult to break down and to digest because it's an, an immensely complicated book. So there are probably different areas that we could start with. So where would you like to start with this? Well, uh, thanks for having me on, Pierre. It's great. It's lovely to see you again. It's yeah, great and, to uh, see you. Now. Yeah, and um, well, the first thing I will say about the book, uh, it's not about the Orion correlation theory. That's the first thing I'll say. Get that out of the way to start with, because there's there's a lot of books about that, and the and it's all been talked about from Baval to Hancock. It's not that's not what the book's about. It mentions it. I mentioned the connections with the three belt stars of Orion lining up with um, you know the the you know the usual alignments, whether it's uh, Mexico, you know, the pyramids in Egypt, the Twin Towers, you know, the, what was the Twin Towers in the World Trade Area, uh, other alignments as well, um, whether it's Thornbrahenge, you know, you name it. There's all these other, it's not about that. I touch on it, but it's not about it. It's about symbolism, as you say. It's about symbolism, mythology, esoterics, ecclesiastical areas, and uh, uh, really the story of how Orion has influenced humanity on a, on a deeper level, how the constellation as an archetype, and possibly more than an archetype, because there's much more to it than that, has had a major impact on things that we would call religion, secret societies, uh, systems of occult. It's all in there. So... Yeah, no, I noticed in the book that there was also a, a very strong emphasis and an influence and, and almost an insp uh, a strong inspiration from the Gnostic tracts and the Gnostic traditions as well. I'm obviously, as a symbologist, very interested in um, sort of um, the Masonic and the secret society connections. Is there anything which you want to talk about the secret societies or do you just want to continue with this? Journey? No, I'll just I'll, I'll tell you something about that, which is, which has interested me, is that if I was to sum it all up, in terms of how Orion relates to secret societies, uh, the the great the the great archetype of everything that is hidden, everything that is relating to the trickster, things that relate to the bringer of knowledge, Prometheus, all those levels of of the secret societies, including the Kabbalah, not the not, the, not necessarily the Judaic Kabbalah. Which is connected more the um, Hermetic Kabbalah, spelled with a Q. Uh, I, it's almost like if you see Orion as part of the zodiac, even though it's not officially part of the zodiac at all, if you know that Taurus is part of the zodiac, and that Orion itself as a um, a star system as an archetype is almost a representation of the hidden the secret aspect of the knowledge that has come now, obviously now to the forefront, that relates to the ancient secret societies going to as far back as Atlantis. And in the book, I call one of the chapters, the age of Orion, the age of giants, which I also see as the age of, of, of Atlantis. Um, so, you know, Orion being born of Taurus as a child of light, almost like, you know, the Prometheus figure in all the Greek myths and, and his brother, Asphastus, and all these other myths. Orion is almost telling the story of the giants, the secrets, the trickster, 
the the mapping of a blueprint against the zodiac and the greater cycles within the pagan calendar because if you think about it you've got the positions of the sun and the moon and the earth and and the what we know as the as the equinoxes and the solstices and all those things but in the background behind that we have the zodiac and and within the zodiac we have the hidden aspects of the zodiac and orion is one part of that very much like the serpent rouge you know the talk of the 13th star sign i know they're all different i know there's the vedic astrology and i know there's chinese astrology and all that kind of thing but generally from a western viewpoint from a babylonian viewpoint and from a judaic viewpoint Orion seems to have a major um, significance to all of these religions, especially Christianity, when you come later into the understanding of what the archetype, the stories of the archetype that relates to Christ consciousness and how that can connect to Orion as this kind of divine figure, you know, this man of the stars. There are various human stars, you know, like um, the shepherd, um, what's his name, um, the plough and um, stars in Arcturus that relate to a figure. But Orion is the most prominent, being the hunter. And the hunter is another important archetype. So I go into all of that in the book. The trickster aspect of it is really, really important. And so is the idea of Adam Cadman, the fallen man of light. If you look at the old... The first tarot cards of the fool, the actual fool figure in the tarot, he's carrying a club like Hercules and he's got three feathers, which are almost representations of um, something else. And you've also got, um, you know, Sir Abbas, you know, the, the figure with the erect phallus and the club down yeah. in Dorset. Yeah. All these align with Orion. The Hercules figure in his original state and the lion connected to Orion is also part of that. And um, so it's the same with many, many of the, um, you know, the old manuscripts where they, where they illustrate the Book of Hours and you have images of the fool and you have images of Adam Cadman. And I mean, for those people that are listening, Adam Cadman was seen as the highest of the high, you know, the highest Adam in, in, his, Adam in his celestial form. Um, to the to the Judaic faiths but really if you look at it it filters into all the other belief systems and religions you know as you probably know yourself I'd just like to um, add a comment about Adam Kadam because there are um, different ways of looking um, at Adam Kadam now the word Kadam um, means the ancient one um, so Adam is the ancient one um, but it also plays in with the ultimate word Kadam which is east now Orion this or Orion's means the eastern one so the eastern one is the Adamic man and the Adamic man is um, symbolized as Orion and that's obviously interlinks um, with the war or the covenant in heaven which is related to the giants which you speak about heavily in your book it, i mean it's true i mean i quote from i quote you in the book several times don't don't i um, i mean I, I i've consulted you a couple of times over bits that I, I i kind of uncovered and i wasn't sure i wanted your thoughts but um do you remember the william blake image do you remember the image of um blake um the blake's image of the, of the giant of albion and in many ways the albion giant is orion um, the, the, the figure who stands next to Stonehenge with the Masonic compass uh, and standing between the sun and the moon. And it's interesting because when you look at the mythology and I took it apart, I spent a couple of years looking at the myths. When you go into Greek mythology, the sun and the moon play an integral role with Orion. They actually are part of the Orion story. You know, and as you said about the Adam, Adam's bloodline is equated with Orion. You know, the old Semite word you talked about, you know, many times in your books, the giants and the Titans and the, the race of giants coming to an end, possibly at the time of Atlantis, maybe just after, you know, in a post Atlantean world. But what seems to be significant within the mythologies are the notion that the sun and the moon were, were part of the, um, the downfall of, of Orion on Earth. So there you have this archetypal giant figure, this this boastful um, uh, godlike, well, god giant, 
the, the, the head of the giant hunters. Orion was the hunter giant, boasted that he, he could kill anything on earth uh, with a giant bow, you know, and, and there's a great painting of Orion um, by the artist Nicola Poussin, who painted the Shepherds of Arcadia. And it's the painting of, of uh, Orion walking blindly, you know, across a landscape with a shoulder, with a figure on his shoulder and a, and a, a Hephaestus. It's, a, it's uh, the figure on his shoulder is the uh, child of Hephaestus and Hephaestus is the brother of Prometheus. And Hephaestus, if you remember from the mythology, he's, um, he's the creator of all, all the things that the gods needed, you know, like um, um, uh, the, the swords and the shields and the uh, Boo Boo the Owl and uh, Talos, the the well. metal gods and all those kind of magical things that relate to robots in some ways. We'll come back to that. Mm. And um, and then you have Artemis, who was meant to be the lover of Orion. And in the painting, Artemis is is on a cloud looking down as the moon on Orion. And Orion is wandering blindly, and he's wandering towards Apollo, the sun. And there's this this symbolism of the. This is where we get the notion of Orion um, being blinded and then can see again. And you've heard that story before in scriptures, but it relates to the position of the sun and it, re it relates to the movement of Orion in the ecliptic. So Orion was, was um, let's say, killed and buried like Osiris is killed and is then resurrected just as Orion is resurrected, just as Jesus is resurrected, you know, in all these similar stories. And... Um, the, the fascinating thing about the painting by Poussin is that Poussin wouldn't have painted that unless it was relevant. This is a major artist figure from the, you know, from that period at the time of the Priory of Sion, the early secret societies in that 18th century period. And he only ever painted significant paintings full of symbolism, like the Shepherds of Arcadia pointing to the... Um, to the tomb with the secrets relating to the um, the Ren Le Chateau mystery and all the rest of it. Won't go into that tonight. But so you've got you've got this kind of figure, which is a major giant figure, a giant amongst the stars and a giant on Earth, who is also um, killed as such by the sun and the moon. The end of an era um, when the age of giants came to an end. But what I've also found interesting when I looked through all the symbolism and I went into the more contemporary area of this was that if you remember the Apollo mission and NASA use a lot of Orion symbolism and Saturn symbolism, of course, because Saturn and Orion are connected and they're connected through the Kabbalah, as I, as I found out. Um, but if you notice on the badge, on the, uh, on the Apollo badge, the original badge, there is, um, it was the Apollo mission. A mission for what? I mean, a mission to go somewhere. And NASA was, I mean, NASA made the Orion Constellation Project its priority. It, 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 did, it, it abandoned it eventually for the, um, the Cassini one, I think, the Saturn voyages. But Orion was meant to be a place they were going to go to. Why would they go there? I mean, it's very near. It's mm -hmm. a very near constellation in terms of constellations like Sirius, you know, um, in terms of light speed and all the rest of it. But there's something about Orion and the sun and the moon, of course, and its relationship uh, with, with the original people of Earth as well, that I was looking at in, in the book in great detail. You know, all the native cultures as well. Um, one example is the Hopi Indians. They were Orion worshippers, Pierre. They, they, they were Orion worshippers, just like many of the other peoples across the across the ancient world, like the Polynesians were. And in the book, I talk about, I show various examples of pictures from the Pueblo art of, of the giant jester, the giant Heoka, who was also a Lakota deity. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. And you've got this interesting, this interesting imagery, this art, which shows this kind of phallic deity you know with a large penis like Osiris with three little helpers holding the the phallic <laughs> up with these are the belt stars of Orion so you know this is all in the book and um, 
the jester aspect, the clown, the joker, the, you know, the idea of the tray, the three stars, all of that relates to possibly the ant people, um, the constellations right near to Orion, right in its vicinity. Um, what's he called? My mind's gone tonight. Begins with Z. Uh, Zeta, Zeta. Zeta Ricure. That's the one. Yeah. You know, all those are connected to Orion. They're very near. They're in the vicinity. And on that subject, when you look at it from a bigger perspective, our solar system is in the Orion Pegasus arm of the of the galaxy anyway. So really, I mean, if you want to say, people say, oh, well, we're in, a, we're, we're in the solar, planet Earth's in the solar system. Yeah, okay, well, where's the solar system? It's in Orion, or it's in the Orion arm. Mm -hmm. So it's, in, it's, it's like Russian dollars in terms of levels of symbolism in many, many ways. That's something that I uncovered as I was going through all of this, um, you know, all of this symbolism. It, it started to make me wonder that I'd, I'd almost have tapped into a bigger picture, like the next level of the matrix in many ways. Um, because, Orion, you know, Orion, like I say, Saturn was a big discovery, Saturn and the moon uh, for authors over the last 10 years, you know, like, um, you know, David Icke and David Tolbert and all these other authors that have looked at Saturn. But Orion is such a major influence on those, on our solar system, for various reasons, not least through, say, for example, the, um, you know, the symbol of uh, uh, the Kabbalah, where you have the, um, the supposed sort of lightning rod traveling through the Kabbalah, the flaming sword, which is interesting because the flaming sword is actually where the nebula of Orion sits and below the belt stars. Uh, which has been given other names by different cultures, not least the Mayans talked of the sacred half, uh, the fire, you know, in, in the centre of that area. You've yes. got the spider symbolism as well. You've got all that spider symbolism that relates to Orion. Can, can I just interject? There's, there's two points there in terms of the sword symbolism. Um, Kerov is a sword in the Hebrew, which relates to the cherubim. And so I think that that's interesting in itself that Orion has this very close uh, cognate with the cherubim. And also you're talking about the spider as well, which is, uh, it's almost like a, a vampiric entity, isn't it? The spider, um, it weaves its web and it sucks the juices from the insect as well. So it, in that respect, it's a symbol of a vampire. Uh, yes. But I, I'll let you continue um, in, in that vein. Well, yeah, what I was saying is that, you know, the, the yeah, you're right, absolutely right. I mean, it, it, it is, it's all about that. But it's almost as though that that's the darker aspect of Orion. It's like duality is in everything, as we know. The duality is the nature of reality on Earth. And uh, for those people that understand it, understand, if you go back into the ancient world, you had this notion of, um, the solar force, the light force, and the dark force, and that's captured beautifully in the um, petroglyphs of the of the um, Ananasi and the Hopi in America. And I've seen these things myself and photographed them, where you've got the Alpha and the Omega. You've got Masawa, or Maswa, or who's, who's kind of inscribed as the as the kind of pumpkin head wearing deity. Like the dark side of, of, of some kind of Christ-like figure. And you have Coco Pelli, the solar life force, which is often depicted as rising out of the head of, um, of Maswa, which relates to the, again, you know, relates to the, the Golgotha and the idea of everything taking place in the mind, memory and thought, and all those things. And that is something that is highly relevant to Orion because it if the Hopi were worshipping Orion and if the Hopi were putting out, um, if they were laying out their, their communities as, on the mesas and the mesas are aligned with, with the Orion constellation, their terrestrial alignments of Orion, like many other places. Um, Gary A. David, in one of his books, uh, a great author from America who spent years looking at this stuff. Um, I highly recommend one of his books called The Mirrors of Orion. And he talks about the alignments in places like the Lebanon, Baalbek, um, the Fertile Crescent, where you've got all these castles, these Crusader castles um, that were also built 
leading outwards towards Byblos and Baalbek, which were aligned with the main stars of, of Orion, not least Betelgeuse, Regal, Sayaf, and so on and so on. So, you know, the, all that kind of symbolism of duality goes on uh, in the stars itself, even the opposing stars of Orion, Betelgeuse and um, Regal, which is something I've considered in the book. And then you've got the Holly and the Oak King, you know, the summer and winter solstice, which massively connects to Orion, because um, from a religious point, from an ecclesiastical symbolic point of view, I say ecclesiastical, not religious, but more of a cult symbolism and pagan symbolism, which came first, you have the um, you have the, the notion that this, this kind of biblical figure, John the Baptist, who's, you know, whose birth is around the time of the summer solstice. Well, this is when Orion starts to climb up again from the dead. This is the rising of Osiris. And then you, Orion is slowly climbing in the northern hemisphere or in the southern hemisphere, depending on which way you're looking at it. And, and until, until he reaches the um, winter solstice, which is the time of the Holy King, the birth of Jesus, and he maps this, Orion maps this, this journey of the sun, uh, you know, in the ecliptic, again, descending into the underworld around the time of the Beltane period in the northern hemisphere and also almost becomes parallel to the to the equator. And it's interesting because the Hopi would plant their crops in that period when Orion disappeared from sight. That was the time to plant when everything went into the underworld to focus on uh, regeneration, renewal, and, you know, and the crops coming up as a fertility deity, so was Saturn, to bring the crops back up in that period. So I, I talk about that in terms of the son of Atom, the son of man, and the Adam Orion symbolism. And you see it everywhere, you know, you've picked it up right? in your books, you've, you've shown it. There was an X-Man Orion symbol I saw in a ancient Arabic manuscript where Orion is forming the X shape as well, which was interesting. You know, the Aleph, the Kar, the Chi, the Alpha and Ox, you know, the, the Mar oh, Man, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Cyrus, the Osiris. Yeah, yeah. and so the crucifixion that, as well. Yeah, all of that is in the book, you know, mm -hmm. so it's all, it all relates to the, it doesn't matter whether it's Greek or Hebrew or Chinese, as you know, because you're the expert in this area, that this stuff relates to Orion. Um, in fact, I remember you telling me um, years ago, we had a conversation about, um, I think you were talking about Arctos and uh, was it Anatole and Dusis? You know, we're talking about these different words for North, West, oh, no. East and South, no. making up the word Orion. Which is the um, cross. Yeah, the medicine wheel and all those kind of things. Then you've got the Chiro. And if you look at the Chiro, Interestingly, when they put the Chiro on the flag, which related to the, um, you know, was it the flag of, Con was it the flag of um, uh, Cons Cons Constantine? Constantine. Oh. He's got the three dots on there, which could relate to the Orion belt. And to guess, I, I think it relates to that kind of uh, yeah, understanding of the Tor more than anything, the, you know, the, the Tor cross. But all of this symbolism, again, relates to Orion. Oh. Um, I mean, you know, it's very interesting. We could go on and on about that particular thing in terms of magic and X's and it, it's everywhere. The X, if you see the X in every aspect of... Um, I've seen a lot of the X in occult symbolism, modern occult symbolism, particularly with the veneration of movie stars. Um, you, you see the X appearing everywhere. Um, but I kind of think it's very interesting where, like what you were talking about with the X-Men, so you've got the cross again, which is appearing, which is um, symbolic. Um, yeah. I think that's what's, for me, what was fascinating about your book is how it combines both very ancient symbolism and astrotheological symbolism and Gnosticism and Zoroastrianism and all this emphasis on comparative religion. But then you also tie it into modern culture as well, and um, in, in terms of films and in terms of advertising and uh, just visual imagery as well. 
your background is in fine art and, and my background is in fine art. And I think that actually loans itself or predisposes itself to having, shall we say, a much more I intuitive way of actually looking at symbolism because uh, symbolism is, is a visual language, but at another level, it, it's also uh, linguistic. It's another type of um, communication. And, and, and for me, I've kind of studied the, if you like, the linguistic aspects of symbolism. And that kind of reminds me of um, a book by Harold Bailey. He wrote um, a text called um, The Lost Language of Symbolism. And that's kind of interesting because when I, when I started to set out writing The Murder of Reality, one of the titles which I'd considered calling the book was The Language of Symbolism, which I later found out was an, an, you know, an Harold Bailey um, book. Mm. But um, for me, it is fascinating this connection between language and symbolism, but it is kind of more complex than that because we're also dealing with other types of languages as well. So then you yeah. have numerical, you got new, uh, a numerical symbolism, which is a type of language, and numerical symbolism li links into geometry, and then geometry links into the physical forces of uh, the universe and yeah. then links into uh, chemistry. So from physics, you get chemistry. The example of the fool I mentioned earlier in the tarot, you've got 22 men major arcana you've got 22 bones in the skull 22 letters in the hebrew alphabet and the, the so-called 22nd card you know the fool uh, becoming the magician and all the rest of it and and all of that is taking place in in the skull of golgotha again so mm. you know it's it's such a it, there's, there's so many <clears throat> excuse me there's so many levels to it you know like like the uh, grammaton you know the um the letters of the hebrew alphabet making up the the human form or the form of the divine, you know, whether it's Yod, it's Yod, He, Vav, He, you know, the actual, um, the, the symbolism of that has fascinated me. I did my own image of that, my own painting at one point, you know, to go with that, um, called the, um, um, I called it the, the uh, heaven, uh, the Adamly, uh, sorry, the heavenly Adam, uh, sorry, the heavenly Adam or the Adam Cadman. And that was something I was, you know, I, once I got into the Kapala, I was absolutely fascinated by that, that, that symbolism, you know, that, that whole region of um, from the Kether through, through, through Darth, you know, the, the idea of Saturn being Darth or Darth, Darth Vader, mm. you know. I'm just thinking of the Empire in Star Wars, you know, the duh, 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 <laughs> and the vibration of that. And then to Tiripath and coming down to Yesod and then Malakoth, you know, the idea of the Earth and this these different worlds which are constructed within this tree, this tree of life, which is also the embodiment of a heavenly structure, which we happen to see in so many areas of, um, you know, the so-called uh, biblical connotations, even right down to the amazing architecture of Gothic cathedrals, where you've got the seraph, you know, the seraph of the tree of life in the actual ceilings of these buildings, all of this is a reflection of the stars, which which reminds me of also the work of another great researcher. I've mentioned him tons of times. I'd love to hear from him. I even emailed him, never heard from him. Fascinated by what he did. And his name is Danny Wilton. And he put together such a, an amazing piece of work, a body of work, especially around the um, high altars and the paintings of Michelangelo and other areas of fine art in that region, that Renaissance period, especially in his book, he calls it Orion in the Vatican, um, where he's mapped the Orion Nebula in great detail against some of these works of art. So you've got, you've got the secret societies going back into the ancient world, mapping the heavens, putting it into the architecture of the great temples and cathedrals. And then we get somebody like Danny Wilton comes along and maps the, the imagery as well, the, the paintings, and all I can see is this even more confirmation as a artist myself, confirmation of a holographic universe and how everything is part of this amazing blueprint of energy that is constructed out of, out of the stars, out of our cells. You know, you know what I mean? It's all this amazing kind of connections. So Orion as a focus for the ancient secret societies and the Masons today, no doubt, um, has, has, has been a huge thing.
and um, absolutely huge. In fact, I'm I I don't I'm not a Freemason. I've been accused of being one a few times. I'm not a Freemason, but I'll tell you this: I would I would be able I'd stake money on it that their rituals at the highest levels relate to Orion. They go beyond Saturn. They go into Orion. Oh, they have to. They have to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the same with me. I've been accused of being part of the Illuminati and, and I'm not because, again, I don't believe in hoarding this knowledge. I think that this knowledge should be freely available. So the idea of actually swearing secrecy to a secret society in order to uh, withdraw the knowledge from public consumption for me is anathema. I just don't believe in that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, absolutely. I totally agree. Uh, but it's very interesting yeah. what you're talking about, Orion, and uh, and the symbolism and the Masonic symbolism. And again, the Orion symbolism seems to go back into um, uh, religious iconography and is very much part of uh, the Gnostic tradition. There's an aspect of the book, which uh, your book, which I found very fascinating, and that's to do with the holographic nature of um, of reality. And oh right, it, yeah. And, 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 and actually, uh, privately, I mean, you've been speaking about this for a long, long time. I, I remember that we were talking about this at least a decade ago. Actually, thinking about it, it was before my son was born. So this was probably about 15, 16 years ago, a long time ago. And um, you were talking about this idea that reality was a projection. Now, um, I, and I think this type of material came into David Icke's um, books and, and, mm. I, and I'm very much aware that your ideas were very influential in terms of influencing David Icke's works or, or this is kind of what I feel because um, some of the um, ideas about um, this holographic nature of reality which you were speaking to me a very long time ago the, it, abs it absolutely uh, blew my mind I mean it, it was very advanced and, and it's um, something which I'd never really at that time um, come across. I mean, now people are writing about this type of uh, material. I mean, I talked about holographic culture, but again, a lot of those ideas were very much influenced by your work and in terms of um, the conversations that we had and the emails that we exchanged. So I'm kind of fascinated about your uh, particular take on this because you kind of combine the Gnostic traditions, but then you combine it with cutting edge science and you all link it together with Orion and um, and um, talk about the sun. And again, this idea that the sun is, I've come across this idea that the sun is a lens. You, you speak about this idea that the sun is a mirror, but mm. really this idea that the sun itself is not necessarily generating the energy. It's, it's rather focusing the energy in a, in a way and you link this into this idea of a holographic uh, universe and um, in, in terms of the projection. So yeah, I'd, I'd like um, your take on that. I'm kind of interested on that. Well, um, gosh, there's so many levels to that. Um, where do you begin? Uh, let me think. What you've got, uh, if you think about energy and you think about what energy really is. So you, if, you, if you imagine the idea of a celestial light or a fire and we know the universe we know from mainstream science that the universe is made up predominantly of plasma which is electricity so we have this idea of celestial light which is talked about um you know by the in, in alchemy and by the mystics and we have this sacred fire and then we have the electromagnetic forces and in terms of the gnostics that you mentioned they would transcribe that or they transcribe that as a, a, a divine upper aeon or the aeons, which was a watery light, which was a light beyond the physical light, not the lights, not the speed of light or the light that allows us to see everything in this reality, even the stars and their projections. Um, but something that is the force that is creating everything that we would see so as jesus said himself you know you 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 all you're accusing the pagans as such as worshiping the sun but you should be paying attention to the force that created the sun so it's that kind of level of understanding and um, so i i drew parallels in the book between this idea of the trinity the power of three and the idea of three lenses creating our holographic reality 
And I saw those as a, almost like you would understand how holograms are being created. You have the, what, which mainstream science have actually accepted that the center of the Orion Nebula, there is a black hole. There is some kind of black hole that is generating and creating um, stars. It's giving birth to stars. It's a, um, you know, it's, it's a form of, um, um, uh, it, it's what the Mayans call the, uh, the sacred fire. So it's a triangle. It's actually a tetrahedron, actually, when you look closely. And this is what is, um, is giving birth to, to not only stars, but maybe it gave birth to our star. Who knows? I mean, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say for sure. But it maybe it gave birth to. If you look at the Orion Nebula, you look at the huge nebulas that have come out of that region and formed, like the uh, Bernard Loop, you know, and all the um, the nebulas, like the Flame Nebula, um, the Orion Nebula, the Running Man Nebula. All of these areas of Orion look like they were. They they came out of this central fire, this central area. And then you also have the focus on, um, you know, the, the fabrication of the three forces projecting to create the cosmos, which relates to the word, you know, the, the trinity, the trinitas, which relates to the number three. And you could transcribe that to the three belt stars, but I'm more inclined to think it's got something to do with the, the, um, the trapezium within the Orion Nebula, which is amazingly... Uh, featured in some ways in the Black Pyramid of Ecuador with its 33, uh, you know, the image of the 30, the, 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 the small pyramid with the, the eye at the top, which is the, you know, the, the one dollar bill and all that kind of thing. Um, but that has got something to do with this place of projection. So I'm building up to this idea that there was this place of projection within the Orion Nebula. And then you go back to try and understand from a higher viewpoint, this synchronicity between these celestial projectors that could create what we would understand as an illusion, a reality, one that could be hacked as well. We'll come back to that in a minute. But this idea of um, the Orion Nebula as the source of the laser and the sun as another reflective mirror as such, a projector, and the moon as a secondary projector. And when you look at the correlation between the sun and the moon, and all of the mathematics, I mean, it's just unbelievable. You know, the idea of the, the solar eclipse and the fitting perfectly into each other. This is the work of something that is, of an intelligence that is um, on a par with a, you know, um, um, a Swiss watchmaker as such. It's this amazing detail in the heavens. So there is a force that has created and positioned these celestial objects as projectors, as refractors to bend light, to change light, and also to anchor in a vibration or energy coming from elsewhere, like a laser is being from one place to another. So the nine worlds, you know, in the, um, in the more Nordic mythology, like Asgard down to, um, was it, what was it called at the bottom? Um, forget the name of it now, it begins with H. Helheim, Helheim. So all of these these areas are no different to the Kabbalah. They're all part of these structures. And I, I often wonder when I've looked at this stuff that the Kether, the highest point of the Kabbalah, is actually the high is the is the Orion Nebula. It's the crown. It's the corona around the sun. It's but where do you go when you walk through the sun? Where do you go next? You know, you leave you leave Tirupeth in the Kabbalah. Some say you, it's funny how they have a passage through Saturn and they bypass through Pluto and Uranus and places like that. But energetically, there is a connection between the Earth, the moon, which I think is a, a secondary portal to what we would call the place where souls go in the afterlife, the white light at the end of the tunnel. And then you have the solar door, which is connected to so many solar deities including Jesus who who was said to have walked through the sun you know and all that symbolism relating to I go back to the father and I I, I um, you know and I, I I leave a place for you there and all those images of William Blake's of passing through doorways 
you know, the idea of the, the Dalet in the Hebrew of the doorway. Mm. That's why I call the book Orion's Door, because it is a doorway from one world into another world, into another world. It's a bit like in that Matrix movie back in the um, turn of the millennium. Was it the revolu was it revolutions or, some, or something know, like sure. that, where they had the door, the, the, uh, the key master going through doorways and portals. Yeah. But from a celestial viewpoint, it's as though I got the feeling that our, our origin, our source of origin is coming from this place in the Orion Nebula, and it could well be like Krita Mutwa talked about and other ancient structures and cultures have talked about, um, that the Orion Nebula was the original Gan Eden, the original Eden amongst the stars. And Adam, the heavenly Adam, was a creation of the Demiurge in the Gnostic tradition and birthed in the stars in that region of Orion before solidity and the settlement of a matrix or a blueprint was created. And um, I feel that Eve, the story of Eve is such rid so ridiculous that um, I, you know, I, I think Eve was already amongst the stars as an aspect, aspect of Sophia in the yeah. Gnostic tradition. I painted that in an image. Um, so, you know, the symbolism of the eye in the hand, the ogi, um, all the ogis relate to, in many ways, relate to the, um, the hand of uh, Khufu, the hand of Orion, the hand of the warrior. And there are various Lakota diagrams of the stars with the chopped hand of the warrior relating to the different positions of Sayaf, Betelgeuse again, um, Regal and the belt stars forming the thumb. So there's all of that connection. The, the, also, what's interesting is when you look at the mound builders, where they found a lot of these ogies on, on beautiful shells, conic shells and other brooches over the years. When the, um, when the Europeans went over to America, you know, the Columbus period, and they interacted with the, um, the Mississippi mound builders eventually, Tulanuska and all those journeys, they, they were amazed to find that the chieftains and the son of the chieftains were actually very tall they were they were they were giants they were they were obviously further down the line genetically but they'd come from giants so and and a lot of the alignments again related to the stars not least the orion constellation you know so there's so much of that you know there's so many connections to that it's um we probably wouldn't have time to go into all of it but you know the holy of holies you know the idea of the position of the the evans and then the sun in the middle, you know, the, again, that's another aspect of it. Um, the eye, the pupil itself, Pierre, you know, the idea of the lamp of the body is the eye. And there, therefore, you know, the, the, the old quote from Matthew, that if this is the lamp of the body, the eye, then if therefore your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. You know, all that symbolism in the, um, in the Bible relates to that, which I think relates to these wonderful kind of, I mean, if I could share them with you, I, I don't yeah. think I've got these on here, but you know those wonderful images of the eye altars with the fiery suns and all the cherubim around them in all of these places, especially the Vatican and all over Europe. They, for me, when I see those, I agree with Danny Wilton. I think they are the Orion Nebula. And when you look closely at the projected light of the, the upper ceilings of some of these places, the enclaves, they look like projectors. You know, there's the moon is full moon tonight. The moon looks like a projector, you know, it looks no different to the, the cinema projector. When you turn around and you see the projector on the wall, you know, and in many ways, that's what we're seeing. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing a movie where the sun and the moon are acting as amazing, super holographic, upper dimensional projections. And I think it goes Orion. And it comes from Orion and it's 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 coming through um, this idea of plasma through the through the Fohat, as Blavatsky talked about it, through this Fohat of energy. Um, and I think it's hacked by Saturn. I think Saturn is the hack. So you've got the Orion Nebula and then uh, which is like a laser and the beam splitters as such in the holographic 
understanding, the reference beam and the beam splitter is almost the sun and the moon. The sun is also a mirror. And what you end up with as the reference beam is the earth itself, the earth matrix, but a hacked version of it, not yeah. the original version. Yeah, it's kind of interesting uh, what you spoke of about the watery light, because I almost see that the watery light is a, a reference um to the waveform because the waveform is like a ripple and the ripple emanates outwards which are, is the aeon but i also see the symbolism there with the watery light that water is connected to the spirit which is feminine which is the breath or the logos and then you've got the soul which is the light or the illumination and so the soul and the spirit is almost um a, a metaphor, if you like, of um, the spirit, which is the personification or the potential, which is embodied into physical matter, which is light. And it's yeah. again, it's that interesting juxtaposition between the um, corporal world and, and the non-corporal or the spiritual and, and the um, solar aspect. And so I, I kind of, I think that's very interesting. And again, the idea, what you were talking about that, Orion is this projector which is uh, projecting reality because it, it, it's interesting because you're dealing then with reality at very multiple levels you're dealing with reality in terms of a physical reality and that physical reality for example was expressed through the Bene Elohim and the sons of the gods but then mm -hmm. there's also this higher knowledge which seems to be interconnected to the um um, the LRK and the Ruach Elohim, the high spirits, the high spirits interconnect with the jinn and this other realm. And mm. in, in my own book, I describe them as masters of waveform. And by that, I mean that they are able to control uh, the interdimensional aspect of reality. So they control both the physical aspect and they also control the spiritual or the interdimensional aspect. And I think that you've got a, a really excellent understanding of that within your book that interconnection between the spiritual um and and the solar or, or solar aspect of reality and now that interconnects with um f physical reality um so well, yeah. coming back to what that is yeah what i was saying before you know this idea of the foha the kundalini we talk about kundalini within ourselves you know from a more eastern mystic tradition and the idea of energy centers within the body the chakras well the energy centers are also part of the tree of life they're part of the kabbalah from a more mystical viewpoint in, in more in the say the judaic tradition but when you look at the the hermetic kabbalah and when i say hermetic i mean people before people start jumping on accusing me of being a, a follower of blavatsky or a follower of uh, crowley it's rubbish what I've done is I've looked at this stuff and gone back and stood back from it neutrally and said, well, OK, so when Blavatsky is talking about the forehat and the Kundalini, could we be also looking at this understanding of a cosmic Birkeland current energy from a from a higher viewpoint, from a biblical viewpoint, ecclesiastical? Is this Jacob's ladder? Is this the notion of the ladder that takes us to heaven, you know, to this heavenly multidimensional house of many mansions? And where the ladder converges creates this eye of Osiris, the eye of Orion, the eye in the Ogi, the eye in the trapezium, you know, all these symbolism that relate to what we what we see as, say, for example, negative symbols like the, the idea of the Illuminati and the pyramid with the eye. But in many ways, they're all they're all very sublime symbolism for this knowledge relating to Orion. And this, this understanding of the convergence of this energy through this, um, this lightning rod, this foat, this Birkeland current that takes us through the tree of life in, into, you know, up to, up to Eden. And there's a quote in Genesis which says, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. Planted a garden in Eden. Where was Eden? Was Eden on Earth? From a holographic point of view, it maybe was on Earth and in the stars. And in the east there, he put a man from whom he'd formed. And I'm still thinking when I think of this, of, of Adam, not Adam on, not Adam, the physical fourth Adam, but the idea of Adam in, in heaven, the heavenly Adam. Yes. And this is why the flaming sword, as you know from your research, the flaming sword is quite obviously the, 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 the sword aspect where the nebula 
in Orion is actually in the sword right below the three belt stars, which was placed there as a guard for those to see that, that were seeking the tree of knowledge. It's a perfect example of hoarding knowledge. The secret societies knew all about this deeper symbolism back then. They knew about the Nephilim, the giants, the variations of that, the worship of the planets, the personification of the planets in their rituals, you know, all of this stuff. Um, they know all about it. They've known about it since, since the ninth time of the Templars, since the time of Atlantis and the priesthoods of, a, of Egypt around the pharaohs. They've known about this stuff. But it's only until recent times that this knowledge is obviously coming through now and it's accessible to all. You know, the, I mean, honestly, Pierre, all this stuff to do with the, the fire in the middle symbolism, you know, this a nebula, which was, it's been in many movies as well. Funnily enough, a lot of the Afonsky movies, who's, um, you know, a lot of the filmmakers in Hollywood that have got some Judaic connections have understood this knowledge. They've, they've got access to some of this Gnosticism, you know, so they, they, they've built it into their, into their movies. When you see the eye in Freemasonry, I don't see the eye anymore. I see the pyramid around the eye and the flames and the, and the nebula. And it's telling you that's the Orion Nebula. That's the hottest part of the nebula that is giving birth to stars. Um, not least a black hole there that, is, like I say, has been, been mentioned many, many times by even in recent years by mainstream science. So, And again, with the black hole, the black hole... Yeah be represented as a pupil as well isn't it because absolutely eyes. totally that yeah and i think um, also if you can understand you know uh, maybe there's a biological reason why the pupil is black but you know it's almost that the light gets sucked into the pupil and it's almost operating like a miniature black hole yeah I, i've thought about that myself a few times it seems to be that there is something connecting us holographically we're all connected in that way. We, we, it is like, are these, are these representations of the sun? Hmm. You know, the sun here, the sun, the light in our eyes. There's so many connections to it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big area that I've, I've looked at. I keep coming back to this idea that, you know, we're all one and we're all part of creation. But are we also... You know, are, are we the gods that we've been waiting for in that sense? I think there's a manly, uh, a manly Hall quote about us being the, the gods and the gods being us, you know, in that sense. We're made up of atoms, but yet we're also made up of stars at the same time. And so I, I see all of that, you know, I, I, I see all of that through everything that I've looked at in the book. Yeah, and this idea that we can actually tune into this information field as well is something that's uh, very in interesting as well. Uh, this idea of um, being able, you know, to clear the mind, which is to clear um, the conditioning of the mind in order to be able to see reality clearly. Um, mm. So things such as meditation or Tai Chi, um, those types of practices lead into seeing reality much more clearly. But again, words often fail because, you know, are you actually seeing reality? It's, um, you know, these are very human ways of expressing something which just is. Um, mm. And do you have, a, a, certainly from my research, going back on um, to the top, topic of Adam, I see that there's a very close connection between Orion and also the Martian man. And I see that the Orion mm. man and the Martian is one and the, is one and the same. Now, um, I, I see this to, uh, re in relation to the Covenant of Worlds and that um, the Orion Man um, went to Mars and then went from Mars to the Earth. I'm, I'm just interested in terms of if you have uh, in interpretations of that, because you were speaking earlier about Eden. Now, Eden is etymological to Adam. As we said, Kadam is um, etymological to East, which is Orion's, which is the Eastern one, or Orion. Um, and, and again, that in the etymology is links into semen, which is reproduction. Um, but the Adamic man also links into Machaden, which is Mars in the Hebrew. And again, Adam meaning red, and Dan yeah. is blood. And even Chadam, which is to annihilate, which is um, the annihilation of Mars. And so... Yeah. The Martian symbolism is very prominent um, in terms of the Adamic man. And, and there is this interrelationship between Orion 
and the Martian man, which is interconnected to the Adamic uh, man here on Earth, um, the manifestation of the Adamic man here and now. So, yeah, do you have any interpretations on that at all? Um, yeah, I, I, I was looking at that in the book as well, you know, and obviously um, I quoted you in the book, hadn't I, about that. I was looking at, um, you know, the idea that the what they call the Temura, you know, the three ancient methods used in the Kabbalah was connected to that, what you're talking about. And I, I wonder whether or not, when I think about, we're going back to some of the other stuff to do with Mars, I, it, we're relating to this period again of the Titans. And I keep coming back to Prometheus and the, the fall of humanity. Was there a fallen race from Orion that went to Mars? This is what this is what you were just describing. That became the fallen chosen few on Earth. I wonder whether that's a connection. The idea of the bringer of light, Prometheus, um, and the idea of Adam, which was the name of Frankenstein in the Percy Shelley story, the idea of a Frankenstein human form as such, genetically, and the genetic you know, um, tampering with, um, with the human genomes. Was there a form of um, humanity that was from Orion, tampered with, brought to earth via mars yes maybe I, I would go with that definitely the symbolism and the and the and all, all of the symbolism that relates to prometheus connects to that and asphastus his brother um, connects to that these were these were almost fire deities trickster deities like the spider in the story of the american indian trickster um, a form of spiders of Mars kind of Ziggy Stardust connection. Bowie knew all about the Kabbalah. It's in all of his, Sounds. in a lot of his work. Um, Mark Boland did as well. Um, you know, Black, Black Star, Bowie's album. I mean, my goodness. I mean, that says it all, really. I mean, without going into great detail, that's all in there. Um, but the idea of the Anunnaki creating the first men on Earth, well, did they create them, you know, as we understand the kind of basic understanding of creating something, was it a golem? Was it a modeled clay form? You know, was it, was it like the classic images you see of Prometheus with the skeleton, with the hammer? You know, all those Greek images of Prometheus. Or was it more like the Frankenstein story in the film uh, Alita? Do you remember that Alita movie? The, the, you know, the, the one where... The, there's this kind of future earth and uh, this 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 um, scientist picks up this body of a half living robot it was out in the movies a couple of years ago and Alita is the chosen one in, in you know in in the Hebrew understanding so you know makes me wonder whether or not the chosen ones were blessed by Prometheus fallen from Mars and in many ways the story of the fall of Sophia in the Gnostic text is a parallel to the fall of Prometheus. There's almost a connection to that as well through the, through the stories. So Alita is the battle angel in, in that film, but, but is also the chosen one. And she's a Frankenstein human form. Um, and this brings me to something that I looked at in the book in great detail. There's a chapter in there called Ancient Future Gods. And um, I was looking at the backstory to what we would understand as gods and robots. And people think robots is a relatively new thing. And you know from looking at things as well that the Japanese are fascinated by robots. Um, well, the robot, robots were part of the Greek mythology. Like, like I say, Aspastus was building what would be considered technological deities like Talos you know, born in, born in full armor, um, like uh, Aristeos, the giants, the, the race of giants, which connects to all this symbolism that relates to things like, um, you know, the idea of, of beetles and the shards, you know, the idea of Vulcan creating these, these kind of race of giants that were, 
were almost kind of like um, invincible to protect the gods. And I've seen so many movies over the years that look like they're relating to that kind of imagery. And I'll give you a good example of what I'm talking about. The giant Aristeos in the Greek myths was the only giant not to be slain in the conflict of the Titans. And I see the conflict of the Titans as that period when um, the fall of mankind was happening, when Mars was clashing with the earth in, 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 in respect of Venus and all these other things that happened to the planets. All that can relate to the clash of the Titans, but it also relates to the clash of the Nephilim and the giants on earth with the gods as well. So uh, what happened in the myth, this giant that, that wasn't slain was actually turned into a, a dung beetle in the mythology, um, into Gaia. The giant was kept safe by turning into this image of a dung beetle to, to escape the wrath of the Olympians, which was Zeus and Jupiter and all these other modern deities. Well, you look at a beetle closely and it is jet black, you know, the, the dung beetle. It's amazing when Lucas was putting the Darth Vader character together, he looked like a bipedal beetle to me. Yeah. He, 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 it's, I mean, I know it's pure visual, but at the end of this, you're dealing with something that is multidimensional and reaches out to the planets as personification. So there's a connection with this dark energy, this black energy and Saturn and Darth in the Kabbalah and the giants like Aristeos, and then you have the shard in London, which is also an all spark, like in the Transformers movies, a it means a fragment, as you know, to cut a notch, and that can relate to the Electra aspect of the beetle's wing. And I look at some of these, these amazing creations in Hollywood, like the Transformers and the Decepticons, and they look, I mean, we know they're sentient living robots, but they look very like a modern day version of some of these Greek mythological characters. And it just makes you wonder whether or not. When I see DARPA in America and the American military using names like Talos for their exoskeleton, you know, military and the black drones and all these things we could talk about, you know, all these other stuff, they they're almost kind of replicating the fallen era of the giants, but bringing it in forward in the timeline into this period where the living gods are the robots and we're into transhumanism. And of course, the big subject that fits all this together is AI. You know, the idea that Europe wanted a robot army back in the press in, I don't know when it was, it wasn't that many years ago, 2018, wanted a robot army to challenge the US and China on AI. And what's that all about? So the, the idea was that the gods of the ancient world, which I still see as being robots, sentient artificial intelligence, are actually now making their appearance again in the modern world through transhumanism, through the Internet of Things, you know, right down to. Do you remember that story of um, Michaela Sousa had one million followers on Instagram? Do you remember that avatar? That, that social media figure who looks so realistic and um, she was, you know, hacked by a Trump troll. It was all in the press at the time when, and everybody thought she was real. It was pure AI. Mm. So we're heading into that area, I think, Pierre. We're heading into this kind of, we're going back to the age of Orion, which I think was pure technology. I, I mean, anybody in their right mind who doesn't think that the pyramids Let's just use those as an example, that the pyramids was not built with some form of technology. I mean, sorry, but there's no way that technology of some shape or form was not used to create the pyramids as a global culture on Earth. I don't buy the New Age stuff on it. Certainly don't buy the mainstream on it. You know, yeah. I've been to I've been to the pyramids in Egypt once years ago, and the story of the pulling of the stones and the yeah. bullshit. Um, you know, there's there's no way on earth that the pyramids were built without some form of electricity or technology. So you know, we're we're back to that age again. And there was a couple of ad, ads um, again a couple of years ago, not that many years ago, for Galaxy Samsung, Galaxy Samsung, 
of the warrior, the galaxy hunter. And it looked very Orion-like. There's so much symbolism that was relating to Orion um, back then. And, you know, I won't go into all the detail, but the idea of apps and, the, um, and what are apps really, you know, and you remember the Uber driver that killed six people saying that the app made him do it and all that kind of thing. So, you know, it's, it, it really gets into what we understand as consciousness and artificial consciousness or intelligence is, is not something that is human. Um, sorry, folks, it's not human. It's actually alien. And it could well be, and I put this forward in the book, that artificial intelligence is actually an alien intelligence that could well have originated in Orion. That's my, my view. Because I was fascinated in, in my book, I was looking at this idea that artificial intelligence could hack the mind. And I see that as a, a real possibility. Because if you think about that, the brain, it, it emits electromagnetic energy and that energy goes out into space. And so I think it's first and foremost, that energy can be read. But I also think that the mind itself can be interfered with as well. And I'm kind yeah. of curious about we seem to be moving into this age now where human beings are very much interested in using the same type of technologies in order to hack the human mind and, and we're going towards that direction mm. um, i kind of find it also interesting that in the japanese the word ai which is spelled ai means love and so um i can oh, I, I could i could see how that connection would be used in the advertising neurolinguistically within the japanese mindset and again I think that's also very interesting in terms of how language is used in order to, let's say, control ideas and to steer the discourse. And so what often mm. happens is that you'll have language which preempts an idea and so it steers the um, discard, uh, discourse, should I say, towards um, a, a pre-considered conclusion or a direction. So this is the manipulation of ideas. You do look at um, AI and you go in the book, you look at the Transformer movies as being, shall we say, a personification of this Orion cult, and particularly <clears throat> the, um, the personification of the robot. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about... Some yeah, of I, mean, I mean, I could share you some imagery with you if you like, but I mean, That's one of the things that has fascinated me is um, we're going back to, again, what I said that relates to Prometheus and Asbestos, which are the fallen aspect of humanity or the gods falling to earth from Mars, from Orion originally in the, in the period of the Titans. Well, one of the figures, um, one of the deities in Greek mythology is Pandora, of course, which was the, the female, um, the original Stepford wife of the, um, the wife of Aspastus and Pandora's box and what Pandora's box really relates to which could relate to AI in many ways, this idea that fire can relate to technology in terms of symbolism and in terms of, I, I think of the word Firefox as well when I think of this, you know, the idea of Mozilla. This is all symbolism that relates to that era, that fallen era of the gods, the inversions and things like that. And Pandora, is very much like that figure from the Fritz Lang movie, you know, the uh, Metropolis, the machine goddess, the dystopia. You the know, the kind of, type of CP3O, really, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, if you can imagine that. And, um, and then you have these kind of, um, these kind of, uh, in, in a medieval sense, you had these, these fire, these fire witches, which were actually robots. And the, the knights in the, some of the knights in the um, in the Grail traditions were actually animated knights. In other words, there was nobody inside them. They were like Talos. They were animated, and um, there's all of this symbolism. Maybe even Da Vinci was playing with robots. I went to Da Vinci's home uh, not that many years ago in Amboise in the Loire um, under the uh, Francis the First. He'd got his own house there, and his tomb is in the actual castle itself. Um, and he was. Da Vinci was building a robot, a, a primitive version, using a knight's body. You know, you've got all of this kind of stuff that you'll know from thinking about the samurai. The sa I mean, at what point some of the samurai armor looks very 
you know, even with the face masks and things, looks like they were trying to emulate some kind of terrifying demeanor that was otherworldly. And I don't see much difference in some ways in what I'm looking at the samurai and the um, and the transformers, you know the so um, you know I know it's a, I know it's a modern day version of it, and I I joked on social media many times I put a picture of a Decepticon you know kind of transformer and I said meet our alien overlords they gave us AI and have transformed our Earth several times over okay. their base is the moon. But they originate in Orion. They built the pyramids all over the Earth and aligned the Great Pyramid at Giza with the Earth and the Moon's circumference, which is true. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah, we're going to build a pyramid and we're going to match it with the circumference. I mean, crikey, these people were amazing. Anyway, never mind that. What's on telly tonight, though? So I was kind of joking with the idea that we we have no idea. I mean, we do. We, we're getting there. I mean, people are consciously becoming more aware of um of the levels of control and blueprints now as it opens up into other aspects of what we're dealing with interestingly enough the original transformer character optimus prime was called orion pax in the original in the original stories so that's interesting isn't it in itself so you've got all of that and i'm convinced that beetlejuice which is a major star you know, in terms of its size, which is about to go supernova at any time, apparently. The Hopi say it could go any time. And they, you know, they mapped their, they they looked at this stuff and so have many other cultures. And um, I'm, I'm wondering whether some of these horn deities, without going into great detail now, we could probably do another, another video on that, but all these horn deities that relate to the Migra and the, um, the horn clans of the Hopi, and the, you know, the, the idea of the horns on the samurai and all, something about the horn and the hunter and Hearn the hunter and Orion, Time magazine with the horns, all this symbolism seems to relate to the secret societies and their, and some of the worship of what we would see as horn devils. I've not, you know, I've seen so many celebrities get horned up over the years. I mean, I made a compilation of them in the book and, um, the, the devil, not the devil god, but the, the trickster deity of the Lakota called Heoka was another dual visage kind of character with horns as well. There's all sorts of connections to it. It's absolutely fascinating once you, once you start to look at it. I'm thinking about the horn as a, a symbol. So in the Hebrew, the word horn, Keren and Koran, which is a uh, radiant and horn. The horn is used to um, symbolize radiance. So again, it seems to me to be interconnected to this Luciferic cult, which is connected to the traditions of Venus. But Venus is the morning star and the evening star. And, and again, it points to Sirius. Uh, and so, and Sirius is um, aligned to Orion. I talk about in my book that there's this connection between the Pleiades, Orion and Sirius. And I describe mm. this as the covenant of worlds because they seem to be the um, star systems which are very, shall we say, influential in the symbolism which we find on, on the Earth. Yes, yeah. I, I, was, I was very fascinated by that in the book because um, I was looking at um, a, a Taurus again. You know, the, the idea of Taurus being... Um, the place where Orion came from. So uh, Orion was born of Taurus in that sense. Orion was fathered by um, by three deities, uh, Vulcan, um, Mercury, and and who else? Who was the other one? Uh, Jupiter, Zeus as such, was fathered and was there's a story about pissing on a, on a bull hide, you know, in the myth. And Uri Urine, as you know, the word etymology, the Urine, Orion, and this birthing of a figure from the, uh, from the um, Taurian constellation. So the, the man of Taurus, or the man of the bull, is actually the Orion figure. And, and, and in the constellation, he's turning to face his mother. Mm. You know, it's kind of all this archetypal symbolism about the the separation of Sophia and the Demiurge, because in the Gnostic, in the Gnostic teachings, Sophia rejects her child 
And her child is, is the demiurge, the God, the creator uh, in the Old Testament tradition. And that rejection would, would also be something that is, um, especially from a mother's son point of view, would be very detrimental. So this idea that Orion is turning on his mother in the heavens, facing the eye of Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, the bull's eye, with the Pleiades in the background, which is the only constellation that actually flies like a flock of birds. I mean, it's, all, the, all the others are kind of, if you look at the Orion constellation, you know, you're seeing the stars mapped out as they are. They're all at different distances. But there's this, this main cluster of stars are all moving like a murmur of starlings, you know, in that sense. So the birds um, <clears throat> being connected to higher states of consciousness, the bull being connected to the horned race and the stability of the mother, Sophia, and other things besides. Um, I mean, you know, I, honestly, Pierre, I mean, there's so much we could talk about. I'm not sure we've got the time. We could do it again another time. But um, it's, it's, you know, it's fascinating. You know, the idea of Apis, the Apis in Egypt, you know, the, the bull and the Cyrus being connected. There's one, there's one statue, I can't remember where it's from, but it's a Cyrus one head and Apis as the other. And this is a, it's like the Roman god Janus, the two heads. Janus, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these are, these are kind of common symbols that I've seen. I've even seen them as the, as Hopi petroglyphs, as Bronze Age petroglyphs, where you've got Masawa depicted with horns and Kokopelli, the solar light force, depicted as the what we would understand today modern terms get get this this is a, a 5000 year old petroglyph he's depicted as the the masculine symbol you know the circle with the so i mean it's bizarre really um yeah so you know th there's there's so much of that we could look at Moses yeah. had problems, didn't he as well yeah again the symbol of the illumination and that's really fascinating um it's as what you say, it's extremely complicated and it has all interlinked into the heavens and to astro theological symbolism. And, and again, it's it goes into the um, processional cycles, it's uh, zodiacal and it's um, it's it's extremely complex because the symbolism is uh, multi layered at many different levels. You've got this uh mythology and then you you see i look at myths as being almost a, a history it's just kind of a veiled history so in in some respects history is myth because history becomes mythologized and yes them show history they're historical and uh this is certainly what we're seeing within the greek and the roman and egyptian mystery traditions is if you like the concealing of human history through its um through the myth maker or mythologizing in history and so yeah i mean for for me that's actually very fascinating in terms of deconstructing what the myth means and trying to tease out the meaning and, and separate the meaning and, and trying to look at the words and the etymology and um, break that down and i think you do that really well because in the book you look at the mythological and the symbolic component but mm. there is also you do anchor it in terms of linguistics as well and so you your work is very sophisticated in, in in that respect it's almost like that your work it doesn't leave any stone unturned it, it looks at the multi-layered nature of symbolism i, I had a bee in my bonnet yeah i had a bee in my bonnet i wanted to know as much about this subject as i could so much connected multi-layeredness to it Says that the book on, on Orion is the most detailed exposition on the symbology of Orion that there is. I, I don't think that there's ever been a book which has been written. I mean, it's over 600 pages long and it's just, it, it, it's mind boggling. It, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, the level of detail and, and the symbols. Thank you. I tell you, there's another thing I, I wanted to mention, which was in terms of mythology, there's also the you know you know the the store the, the stories of King Minos you know the and Poseidon, um, which relate to Orion. You know they talk about this boy who had the ability of running on the waves, um, and he could and he could stand and not get bruised. And this 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 figure. And there's a quote from Peter Kruger's work which he talks about Orion the child was born of Horaeus, 
called urine or urine. This is where the bull connection comes in that I was mentioning earlier. From happening through an account of his charm and, aff and um, affability, he became known as Orion. And it's interesting, the symbolism of walking on water, which is attributed to Jesus mm. later on in the, you know, in the, um, in the New Testament, is actually a feat that was said that Orion could do. Orion is the, the son of man, the son of Atom figure that I think in Judaic tradition, they knew all about this. And it's fascinating that on the, when they were selecting political leaders, um, like, like when they, they put um, Macron in place in France, for example, a few years ago, the first ever image of Macron I saw on the cover of, um, I think he was on the cover of a, The Economist, and he was walking on water and he was Europe's saviour. Now, this is the level of symbolism that is going on within the Masonic structures and within the media. So, you know, and I go on about that in the book and I explain examples of it. But I just wanted to mention that. Oh, yeah, the three. I wanted to look it up. It was Apollo, the sun, Vulcan and Mercury. They conceive Orion in an alchemical kind of uh, what they call a philosophical child. And there's lots of alchemical illustrations of Orion being birthed from this bull. That's coming from Taurus. Thinking that Mercury is the messenger god, Vulcan would be Mars. And uh, sorry, what was the third one? The, uh, the sun, Apollo, the sun, okay. which makes perfect sense. It's covertly, Apollo is represented as Sirius. So uh, in, in the Roman mysteries, yep. uh, the overt symbol of Apollo is the sun, but the covert symbol of him is of, of Sirius. And, and so, again, the twinning of the solar sun with um, Sirius and Sirius, again, has this very strong connotation with Orion. So it's, it's all feeding back in terms of the symbols. Well, Mer Mercury's ability to fly was given to him by the creations of a space there, who so was Vulcan, well, yeah. Vulcan's brother. The mm. idea of this kind of um, being able to have technology that allowed him to have these little wings on his on his shoes and the helmet, all of this, this were, all these are stories of, of technology in the ancient world, the ancient future gods. And then you've got Argos in Greece, you know, the uh, Panaptis with the eyes all over his body, standing guard as a guardian to the ox, to the bull, the bull, the bull of Wall Street and the many eyes the uh, of Argos, not the shopping chain. That's, that's part of the symbolism as well. You know, yeah, it's so, lazy, I think, in the Greek, um, but the, you've got the many eyes again, which is the watchers, and the watchers are struck down with the ones with the swords, which again are the symbol of the cherubim. So again, this is kind of representing the seraphic component, which is the seraphim in this war in heaven with the cherubim, which are these uh, humanist tradition, this, this split within the occult knowledge between the serpent and the, and the humanist tradition. Yeah, yeah, you've got Mithra slaying the bull which is another uh, variation of it. And the one that I found interesting was the Bernie Taylor book be called Before Orion, which he talks about the um, finding the faces of, of all these different heroes. And he's looking at cave art, especially Paleolithic art. And you know that famous image of the wounded shaman that has been talked about, you know, over the years with the, the shaman falling back, this big stick figure, and behind him is a bird, like a water bird, and there's the bull in front of him. That's Orion, Orion and Taurus. The water bird could relate to the solar life force, which I've seen in other American Indian petroglyphs. Yeah, it's um, very interesting, the connections between um, birds and the symbolism there. Um, again, in terms of what you were speaking about with Mercury, with the winged feet, in, in the Roman mysteries, the um, genetic uh, they describe the genetic component as not a fingerprint as what we would, but they describe it as a, as a footprint. And so the shoe, the sandal shoe with the um, wing would denote um, a heavenly offspring, and that would denote the genetic footprint. So again, the symbolism is very... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I mean, honestly, Pierre, we could go on and on. I mean, you know, the idea of the caves of creation in Orion, you know, the nebulas. I found some interesting diagrams in a, in a, what looked like a Toltec, um, manuscript relating to the fifth sun and the Aztecs and all these things matched the same symbolism so they were aware of that yeah. then you had the duality blueprint this is why red and blue is used a lot in politics and the modern world the corporate world 
you know, Harvard and Yale, um, the, ble the red and blue pill in the Matrix, all this kind of symbolism yeah. relates to Regal and, and Beetlejuice. Yeah. In Freemasonry as well, you have um, the, the red and the blue symbolism, which is very prominent, um, and the different orders within Freemasonry as well. The, I think Beetlejuice was called the Reddish Nova, and it re related to the Ninth Gate, the House of Orion. So it was, a, it was a doorway within Orion. So you go through the sun, you go through a portal, and you arrive through the Ketha, the crown, and you enter into the Orion Eden, the nebula, but there are portals around it and the ninth gate or the ninth star was in sanskrit the bahu you know if you've heard that part of the indo understanding of the constellation of the stag which where we get the horn race from again so so much of the beetlejuice symbolism seems to have horns and do you remember the movie beetlejuice with michael I, keaton it's on my list to watch i've never yeah, seen it's it an it's movie. Movie. dressed in black the clown dressed in black and white He's dressed right. as a Hayoka. He's dressed right. as a Lakota, Hayoka, trickster clown. And the, hey, and the Lakota said that the Hayoka came from Orion, from Beetlejuice. All that stuff was known about. It's all known about. I mean, in the Beetlejuice movie, from the imagery which I've seen, the Beetlejuice character looks almost like he's dead, isn't he? And again, the clown also yeah. alludes to the idea as well. I think what's interesting with the clown is that the clown's got a red nose, and that, to me, is um, going into the symbolism of, uh, well, you smell the wine, but uh, this is going back to the ritual where they would terrify the victim, and then this uh, smelling of, of the victim, which is connected into the life force, and mm. the red nose is the dipping of the nose into the blood, which is um, symbolic of, of the clown. So it has very, shall we say, very sinister connotations and very occult connotations. But um, yeah, this is going into the negative aspect of Orion. Yeah, do you, see, right. do you see that it's, it's a duality in terms of that there's a positive aspect to Orion? And then there's a negative aspect. Do you almost see that the negative aspect is what you speak about this hack to reality? But that, if you like, uh, the Orion, this reality, the physical reality is being hacked, but the ulterior reality or, or the reality which underpins this, which is ultimate reality, is this which is unhackable almost. How do you view that? I, it, it's a little bit like. Um... It, it's no different to the, the religious understanding of, say, Christ consciousness and, um, and, and the opposing aspect of that, the Antichrist as such. I mean, I'm keeping this in terms of symbol, simple language. It's the chessboard. It's the black pieces and the white pieces. But we don't really know um, which side is which. It's only through the actions of the, the, um, the archetype that is that is the most important but yeah the dark aspect of orion is all of the stuff that we've been talking about the secret societies the um you know the the highest levels of the i hate to use the word but the sabbatean the you know all the stuff to do with satanism at at that that level of understanding is the darker aspects i really feel that the the understanding of Christ consciousness in the Gnostic tradition, as a as the Cathar tradition, is the place where we reach that higher level of understanding through understanding the higher consciousness connected to, say, for example, the Orion and the Orion Nebula. The whole idea of returning to the Father as such could be construed as returning to the Demiurge. But let me explain Christ consciousness point of view. It might not be that. It might be returning to the creator or to not even that, to the infinite source, to oneness. Because in, in the hierarchy, as such, if there is a hierarchy, in the Gnostic viewpoint, you the 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 creator, the demiurge, the creator of this this reality, our, including our solar system, and the position of certain planets and stars is actually of a lesser degree or a lesser intelligence than the place that Sophia was born from and the idea of the creator the eternal one her father and mother the infinite divine consciousness 
from where also Christ comes from as well. So I would say that the upper areas of Orion going through the nebula into pure consciousness, higher super consciousness, the place of Christ, con Christ consciousness and the divine goddess, Sophia, is actually the, the positive aspect of Orion. The lesser aspect of it, the more demonic, the fallen, the Prometheus, through the Titans into Saturn, Satan, through the Kabbalah, through the tree, coming down to Malakoth, the earth, is the lower end of the understanding of the Gnostic universe or the Gnostic heavens. Again, it's linking into this um, idea of uh, light and shadow. I mean, shadow in itself is a very interesting idea. But the idea that the physical flesh is somehow linked into the shadow of something which is, it's almost like the physical infers a truth, but the um, shadow itself blocks out the light, which, which is the truth. But for, for the shadow to exist, it's, there's a physical materialization, which is almost ah. blocking out the light. There would, be no, there would be no shadow if there was no light. It's the same, yes. looking at it that way. Yes. And, and we don't appreciate the light unless we're in shadow. You know, it, 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 that's the duality um, of, of the understanding of the illusion and the reality that we're living in. This is why duality is the key, the key to understanding why we have what we have, whether it's black against white, separation and division. The understanding of the difference between, say, and the symbols I talked about, like the difference between Masawa and Kokopelli, what Christ said in the in supposedly said in the New Testament. I came into this world not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. What sword? The sword of truth to divide and to and to set mother against daughter, father against son. Your own family will be your your uh, worst enemies. This is all about the duality and the nature of this kind of energy we're talking about. So I see a major connection to the higher levels of the understanding behind the tree of life, the um, Adam Cadman and Christ consciousness on one level. I don't, funnily enough, I don't think that that is really talked about in the Kabbalah at all. And it's not really mentioned in the Hermetic understanding of the Kabbalah. Um, it's, it's a different thing completely. I wonder sometimes whether the idea of a, a new world order um, is really, can be seen in the same light. Is it going to be a dystopia with AI and the new messianic era being born and ushered in, centered on certain places, you know, with a central com control grid? I call it cyber grid reality in the book, a cyber grid empire. Is it going to be that or is it going to be the complete opposite of that in, in terms of duality? Again, the choice is down to consciousness. It's, it's down to human consciousness making those decisions based on based on how much we actually want to be part of a you know part of the next phase of evolution. I don't have a negative feel about the the. I see the negativity and I see I see the darkness for what it is. I'm the expert at seeing the darkness, but I don't. I really don't think it's going to come to that. I, I, I feel there's a human, I, I have great faith in, in the 144,000, if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> a monkey. Yeah. yeah. I, I look at it that way as well. I almost think that it, in a sense, 9-11 kind of um, challenged the conformity of a lot of people's thinking. But I almost see that the post-COVID years are going to wash away a lot of this negativity which we've been seeing. And I also feel that what's really important is human um, sentience. And I think that this is going to um, come in much more, there'll be much more of an emphasis on, on human sentience. Because basically, when I look at wars and I see what's going off in the world today, we are killing our greatest resource, which is this human sentience. And, and it's something which is very, very sacred. And I think once people mm. begin to realize that this intelligence is sacred, I think that they're going to look away from AI. Mm. And I'm not saying that there's not, shall we say, a use 
for computers because obviously I think uh, computers can be um, used in a way which is ethical. And I actually, th uh, you know, I'm an optimist. I think we can use um, computers in a creative way to solve problems. But our most important resource is not the computer, but it's uh, sentience. And I'm talking about human sentience, but it doesn't necessarily have to be human sentience because obviously there's a greater sentience within the universe itself, within terms of the cycles, within intelligence, within animals, in terms of um, intelligence yeah. in the vegetable kingdom. So I'm really talking at a, a, a much larger level, but obviously that is encompassed or personified, certainly from our perspective uh, with the human mind, because we are human beings and we look at things from a human level. So yeah. like you, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic. I see now as very much a washing away of the old order. And I, and I, I do see that there is this, um, if, if you like, this po polarity which has been accentuated. And I see that it's being purposely accentuated in order to create division. And it's very interesting about the metaphor which you used in terms of Jesus coming with the sword, again, the cherubim symbol. Mm -hmm but the sword which is used to divide, but is also used to cut and to analyze and to deconstruct, to dissect, which is knowledge. And so with the sword comes the truth and with the truth comes the realization. And mm. the realization that is what you were saying earlier, that we are one and that we are interconnected. And if we can combine our mind, and I'm not talking about through AI, but we're talking about in a real profound and a spiritual way, then mm. humanity can really become something which is very glorious. We can become this, if you like, this resurrected man, which um, the narratives in, you know, in the gospels talk about in terms of the Jesus figure and the resurrection of man. Absolutely, I love that. I mean, I'll. I'm, as we go, I'll leave you. I'll leave you with this. I read a book called *The Electric Jesus* not that many years ago by a guy called Jonathan Tallet Phillips, um, and there was a little quote in there that, and based on what you're saying, and he and he's simply this: he said, "When the illusion is stripped away, I could see that we were part of an ocean of light. We are light, flowing, moving, transmuting shape." Just like water morphs into steam, ice and snow, we are all part of the same ocean of light. And I think that's that's something that, you know, I, I, that's how I see it. That's how I see the world in that way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, again, the idea that light can be split into its different waveforms, but yet each waveform is an integral aspect of the oneness in the same way that, obviously, in the physical world, you have different types of animals, which are, if you like, uh, split from the light, but everything is one, ultimately. It comes from this one source of intelligence. It's, it's that intelligence which grows my beard. It grows the plants. It's, uh, Absolutely. It recycles everything. Uh, I think that's a real wonderful thought to actually um, leave our listeners to ponder on. So thank you very much, Neil, for um, spending your time for going really into depth into Orion's Door. I do recommend my listeners to buy the book because I think it's, it is the most important book which has been written about Orion. It, it's a fantastic book. It's a very detailed book. It looks at everything in terms of Orion's symbolism. Um, and again, if, if you want to learn about symbolism, um, Neil deconstructs what symbolism is and, and, and the symbol of Orion. So I recommend that book. As I said before, I think it's certainly one of the best books I've read on symbolism in the last decade. I mean, this is how, how much I rate the book. And I've spent, you know, the best part of a couple of decades myself looking into symbolism. So Neil is a genius. Take my Thank you. Yes. Uh, you're so kind. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.